A shy history say that a people so ancient they had no name first tamed dragons in the shadow and brought them to Valyria, teaching the Valyrians their arts before departing from the annals. According to the world of ice and fire, the people who taught the Valyrians had no name. When Bran meets the children of the forest, he asks one of them, do you have a name? She replies, when I am needing one, which basically means no, but later on we learn that the children don't use names at all, as Bran and Mira had to make up names for them. However, it's actually because their true names were too long for human tongues. No human man could speak them. Therefore, if the children ever met any other humans, they wouldn't bother giving their names, which would explain why they'd go down in history as a people with no name. And yes, they are referred to as people throughout the books, even referred to as an elder race, which matches up with the people from the shadow being ancient. Furthermore, the key passage regarding these ancient people refers to their knowledge as arts, and in two other separate passages within the world book, we have the words art and arts together with the children or green seers, but also Valyrians in both passages, and this is simply because they both knew the same things. Therefore, what the children could have taught the Valyrians, besides dragon taming, is the great art of working obsidian and seeing events at a great distance, or communicating across half a realm through the lost arts of dragon glass candles. After all, the children did have a history of teaching things to men. They actually taught the first men how to communicate through ravens. But if this theory seems far-fetched, consider that obsidian, or dragon glass, is essentially fire magic, because not only is it used to kill the others and power glass candles, but the very element of fire itself can be conjured forth from the stone. Fire can be awoken from dragon glass, which means the children have literally had fire magic in their hands for thousands of years. But if they were the people from the shadow, were they even in Essos in the first place? Well, there is a large forest in Essos, in which there dwelt a gentle race of creatures who maesters believe were kin to the children of the forest. Yet, they may have also been in another forest in Essos, in Masavi, a cold, dark land of shape-changers and demon hunters. It's been suggested that shape-changer is just another name for skin-changer, what the children essentially are. Furthermore, the only other people who called themselves demon hunters were knights of the Faith of the Seven, the religion brought to Western by the Andals, who saw the children as demons and hunted them down, just like everyone in Westeros south of the Wall hunts down skin changers. Therefore, it shouldn't be too far-fetched that these demons being hunted in Masavi are the children of the forest. And demons are also found in the Shadow, where the people who taught the Valyrians came from. These demons reside among the Mountains of the Morn. Like the dragons, these demons make their lairs in caves that pockmark the cliffs. The children also live in caves. In fact, the only remaining children reside in the cave of the last Greenseer, and one of them said they have lived in these caves for thousands upon thousands of years. Not only that, but their caves also have a place where skeletons of gigantic bats hung upside down from the ceiling, and Daenerys once found her dragon Viserion clinging to the roof of a pit like some huge white bat. So could these skeletons of gigantic bats in caves of the children actually be dragons like those in the caves of the shadow? The shadow, which has a black river with blind fish, just like there's a black river with blind fish in the cave of the children. The children, who have great golden cat's eyes, that could see down passages where a boy's eyes saw only blackness, which actually makes their eyes suitable for the dark and gloomy lands of the shadow. However, nothing grows in the Shadowlands save for ghost grass, so how can this be suitable for the children? Well, because ghost grass is likely their werewoods of Essos, because werewoods choke out other trees, just like ghost grass murders all other grass. Ghost grass also glows in the dark, supposedly with the spirits of the damned, which is like how the spirits of the children go into the werewoods when they die. But not only could ghost grass be the werewoods of Essos, they might also be the White Walkers or Others of Essos. Because both the Others and ghost grass are pale as milk glass. Ghost grass is also prophesied to cover the entire world and end all life. Just like the darkness and cold of the Others is prophesied to cover the entire earth and end all life. Because the Others hate every creature with hot blood in its veins. Finally, both of them are either found beyond the walls of Ashai in the shadow, or beyond the wall in the north, the north being where the last children are currently found.
So could they also be found in the shadow? Well, first, we would have to connect them to Stagai, which lies in the heart of the shadow. To establish this connection, we will use Melisandre. At Castle Black, when peering through the flames, the Shadowbinder Melisandre of Ashai glimpses Bloodraven, who is a Greenseer, and this terrifies her so much that she shudders and even has traumatic flashbacks. Why did seeing a Greenseer frighten her so much? What does the Shadowbinder Melisandre of Ashai have to fear? Well, what do all Shadowbinders fear? Shadowbinders are the most sinister sorcerers of Ashai, it is said. They alone dare to go upriver, past the walls of Ashai, into the heart of darkness. Yet, there is one place they dare not go, one place they live in absolute fear of. The farther from the city one goes, until at last one stands before the doors of Stagai, the corpse city at the Shadow's heart, where even the Shadowbinders fear to tread. So, one Greenseer struck absolute terror into one Shadowbinder at the wall. Whatever lurks in Stagai strikes a similar terror to them all. Melisandre also once thought to herself, she was stronger at the wall, stronger even than in the Shy. So behind the walls of Ashai, Melisandre's magic is strong. Behind the walls of the wall, Melisandre is even stronger. But what lies beyond both walls? Well, according to Bloodraven, the dark places of the earth. Never fear the darkness, Bran. The strongest trees are rooted in the dark places of the earth. Darkness will make you strong. Beyond the wall lies the darkness of Bloodraven's cave, where he is training Bran to make him strong. Perhaps stronger than he would be beyond the walls of Ashai, into the heart of darkness, at Stagai, the corpse city at the Shadow's heart, a place that is perpetually in shadow, save for a few moments at midday when the sun is at its zenith. So, surely Stagai in the Shadow is one of the dark places of the Earth, such as Bloodraven alluded to, just like his very own cave. In fact, because of winter, the general location of the cave seems to be turning into another heart of darkness, according to Bran's point of view. Dark came early this far north. Each day seemed shorter than the last. The days marched past, one after the other, each shorter than the one before. The nights grew longer. In both places, there flows a black river teeming with blind fish. In both places, the days are short and the nights long. They are the dark places of the earth, and it is in such places where the strongest trees are rooted, and thus, possibly the strongest green seers, who strike fear into shadowbinders like Melisandre of Ashai. Shadowbinders, who supposedly hide their faces from the eyes of gods. But is it the eyes of gods or the thousand eyes of green seers? Now, let's address two issues one may have with this theory, that Stagai is or once was a dwelling of the children and their green seers. Stagai is a city with doors. It could be argued that the children had no cities and no use for doors. Yet, this is not true. Before entering the cave of the last green seer, Mira asked Cold Hands if there was only one way in, and he replied, the back door is three leagues north. Additionally, the children also lived in hollow hills, and in places like the Westerlands, there are half-hidden doors in the sides of wooded hills. Not only that, but their homes in the forest were referred to as wooden cities, secret tree towns, and secret cities. Thus, it is plausible that Stagai is yet another one of their cities. Because not only is Stagai called a city, it is called the Corpse City. And Bran constantly refers to Bloodraven as a corpse, a corpse lord, a grisly talking corpse, and a half corpse. However, Bloodraven is not the only corpse in the cave, so to speak. Because Bran actually saw more children, or singers as they call themselves, enthroned like Brynden in nests of werewood roots that wove under and through and around their bodies. Most of them looked dead to him, but as he crossed in front of them, their eyes would open. So the children really do have a city full of corpses. A corpse city just like Stagai. Additionally, the cave has chambers full of bones. It is home to the bones of thousands dead, littered with the bones of birds and beasts, and other bones as well. Big ones that must have come from giants and small ones that could have been from children. In Nietzsche's carved from the stone, skulls look down on them. With all these bones, the cave of the children seems like a necropolis, which is synonymous 
with Corpse City. So, not only do the children have parallels to the ancient people from the shadow, and parallels between their cave and Stagai in the shadow, but the shadow as a whole is very much a parallel to the lands beyond the wall where the children are currently found. However, if they were the people from the shadow, this would also answer several questions, such as, why exactly did the shadow people teach the Valyrians their arts? What is the meaning of A Song of Ice and Fire? How did the children help the last hero? How did he get Dragonsteel? What is the ending of The Song of Ice and Fire? And why was Valyria destroyed? But before answering these questions, we must clear up some misconceptions about the people from the shadow and also strike down the common strawman arguments against this theory. For starters, the people from the shadow don't have to be the same people who built the fused black stones predating Valyria, as it's established in the first book that dragons had two locations of origin, the shadow but also the Jade Sea, which has twin fire islands, perfect for dragons, but also near the Isle Lang, where there existed another ancient people who could have also tamed dragons, but instead built the fused black stones, especially since they built labyrinths, and one of the fused black stones is a labyrinth. I covered this in my previous video. Therefore, since there are two places where dragons originated, there can be two distinct people who tamed dragons before the Valyrians. One who tamed dragons to build fused black stones, and another who tamed dragons to teach the Valyrians. Furthermore, many readers like to say the ancient people from the shadow were ancient Ashai, which doesn't make any sense, as ancient Ashai already had a role in this event as historians. Why would Ashai histories refer to themselves in the third person as a people with no name? Why would they forget their own name? This theory unfortunately stems from the misconception that Ashai is no different from the shadow. However, the distinction between the Shadow and Ashai is established in the very first book, in which Daenerys goes to the Eastern Market and distinguishes between people from Ashai and people from the Shadow. Then, in the second book, we are introduced to Quaith of the Shadow and the Melisandre of Ashai, who are never interchangeably called Quaith of Ashai or Melisandre of the Shadow. Thus, we should not interchangeably refer to the ancient people from the Shadow as ancient Ashai. This misconception may have all started from this line in the first book, when Bran looks at Ashai by the shadow, where dragons stirred beneath the sunrise, which has been misinterpreted to mean dragons were in Ashai, but if that were the case, then Ashai by the shadow would have been hyphenated into one title, as it is in other instances. What is meant by this line is that dragons stirred in the shadow, not Ashai. Ashai is more than likely related to and built by the Deep Ones, as it is greasy black stone, and the other early greasy black stones share fishy motifs like a kraken and a toad, and are related to the drowned god, and people with a fish-like aspect to their faces. Not to mention that the greasy early black stones are carved, and thus did not require dragons to make, unlike the fused black stones, which did require dragons, and conversely had no chisel marks of any kind. With all this clarified, we can confidently say that Ashai doesn't need to be related to dragons or people from the shadow. Now, if the children are the ones who taught the Valyrians, how does this relate to the meaning of the title of the series? Well, to begin with, George R. R. Martin has admitted that A Song of Ice and Fire has multiple meanings, which is interesting, considering that the children actually call themselves the Singers, the Singers of the Songs of Earth. Their magic is also called singing. Their Hammer of the Waters, for example, was a song. So obviously the singers must have something to do with the meaning of a song of ice and fire, but how? Well, if their magic is called singing, and they created the others who are made of ice through magic, then the others must be their song of ice. And this might be hinted at in the books, because when Bran heard them sing, he thinks their voices were as pure as winter air, which is odd phrasing coming from the author, as we all know that winter air is best signified by the others, as they are the ones who bring the cold. Furthermore, after a conversation with one of the singers about their extinction, this is what Bran concludes. The singers sing sad songs where men would fight and kill. This single line explains why they would have created the others, because they themselves are not fighters, they are singers. Therefore, they must have sung the Song of Ice to do the fighting for them. This would also answer the question pondered by Maesters about the people from the shadow. 
Yet, if men in the shadow had tamed dragons first, why did they not conquer as the Balloonians did? Well, because they were not men, they were singers, who sing sad songs, unlike a man who would fight and kill and conquer. Now, the last green seer once said, every song must have its balance. So surely even a song of ice and fire must have its balance. This could then apply to the balance between the physical forces of ice and fire, between the others of the land of always winter and the Valyrians of the land of the long summer. Because as the world book says, the world has known ice in the long night and it has known fire in the doom. Therefore, when the long night happened and the others devastated the earth, this must have been an imbalance in the song of ice and fire. Ice became too powerful and pervasive. In fact, since since the children helped defeat the others and end the long night, they must have agreed that the others, their song of ice, became too powerful. Which raises the question, how did they restore balance to a song of ice and fire? How did they defeat the others? Well, if a song of ice started the long night, then surely another song would stop it. And sure enough, according to one legend in Essos, to stop the long night, a secret song was sung to bring back the day. And who better to sing this song than the singers, since all the tales agree that the others only started losing when the singers came into the picture, thanks to the last hero. But what was this secret song? Well, it must have something to do with fire, since that is the opposite of ice. And it must have something to do with dragon steel, since that is how the others were defeated by the last hero. And this is where the Valyrians come into the picture, because both Sam and John believe that dragon steel was Valyrian steel, all but confirmed by George saying the long night happened closer to 5,000 years ago at a time when Valyria was rising. Now, since Valyrian Steel was the reason the last hero defeated the others, Valyrian Steel must then be the reason the children created the Valyrians, because the children did not know how to work metal or make steel. All they knew was magic, yet magic steel is exactly why the others were defeated. This is why the Valyrians were created, so they could create dragon steel, capable of defeating the others and bring balance to a song of ice and fire. They are the song of fire. They were created to be the antithesis to the others. Or is it a coincidence that the arms and armor of the Valyrians is dark and black, whereas the arms and armor of the others is pale and translucent? Is it coincidence that George has called both the others and Valyrians inhumanly beautiful? and that they are respectively from the land of always winter and the land of long summer. These are likely no coincidences. Essentially, on a macro level, the story we are reading is the story of the singers and the effect their songs had upon the world. Their song of ice, the others, and their song of fire, the Valyrians. Together they make one song and it is a song of ice and fire. Because nearly every event in the world was somehow affected by the others and the Valyrians, by their zombies and their dragons, by their long night and their doom. It goes back to that line in the world book. Having said all this, however, I do not believe the secret song that brought back the day was the Valyrians per se. I believe that secret song was the forging of the dragon steel wielded by the last hero. Why? Because that secret song was sung in the Rhoyn, and the people of the Rhoyn were pioneers in metalworking. They were actually said to be the first to learn the art of iron making. In fact, the Valyrians supposedly learned how to work iron from them. Therefore, if a blade of dragon steel needed to be forged, the best place would be the Rhoyn. And it would be forged with help of magic from the Valyrians and the children, who would then bring it to the last hero. Because this is actually what the stories of the Long Night imply. They imply a correlation between the children and the dragon steel wielded by the last hero. For starters, we know the last hero went looking for the children to help him defeat the others. We know he found them, and we know they helped him, according to what Old Nan told Bran. We just don't know how they helped him exactly. However, we will later hear another part of the story, that the last hero slew the others with dragon steel or Valyrian steel. How exactly did he obtain Valyrian steel, and how exactly did the children help him defeat the others? Well, if we simply combine both stories, the simple answer would be that the children helped the last hero defeat the others by giving him that Valyrian steel. 
More importantly, the reason the children would have had Valyrian steel is because they were already in contact with the Valyrians, because according to this whole theory, they are the ones who taught the Valyrians everything they know. Now, how would this theory tie in with the ending of the series? Well, George said the ending will be bittersweet, but what not many people realize is that when he said this, it may have been a double entendre, because in the books, he has Melisandre imply that ice is bitter and fire is sweet. Therefore, if the ending to A Song of Ice and Fire is bittersweet, it could mean that the ending is something that happens to both the forces of ice and fire, to the others and the last Valyrians. At the same time, however, this particular ending must also fit the more obvious definition of bittersweet. And what would be more bittersweet than the others being defeated, but also the last Valyrians dying, along with possibly the last dragons, especially since this would also be a conclusion sought after by the children. Because if the others were a mistake, and the Valyrians were only created to rectify this mistake, then the Valyrians must go along with the others. By having the last Valyrians die along with the others, the children would simply be tying up loose ends before they themselves go extinct. Because just like the others, the Valyrians caused great damage to the world. They conquered and burned countless lands, and even killed the gods of the River Rhoyne, which are much like the gods of the rivers worshipped by the children. So clearly the Valyrians became out of control, just like the others. Clearly the children would want them gone, just like the others. In fact, the children may not have only been behind the Doom of Valyria, they may have also been the ones who saved House Targaryen from the Doom of Valyria. To begin with, the Doom of Valyria sounds almost word for word like the breaking of the Arm of Dorne caused by the children. There are many other clues, but not enough time in this video. It could be that, although the children wanted the Valyrians gone, they still needed one family to survive and defeat the others in the future. Thus, a green seer of the children then sent a dream vision to Daenys the Dreamer to ensure that one family did survive. Now, it could be argued that the dream was sent by a glass candle user, not a green seer, as both can visit people in dreams. This is unlikely, however, as Daenys the Dreamer, being a Valyrian, must have already been familiar with glass candles and could probably tell when she is being contacted through one. This dream that prompted her family to flee to Westeros must have then been perceived as something else entirely, otherwise they would have not have acted upon what could have just been someone with a glass candle. It had to have been a dream from another source, a green seer. By having the last Valyrians in the same continent as the others, the children's goal may be to have them kill each other in mutual destruction, tying both loose ends in one fell swoop, bringing an end to their songs of ice and fire, which would be the bittersweet ending of a song of ice and fire. And the reason the others are marching south could simply be because they are being manipulated by the children to do so. Just like Bloodraven manipulates events in the Seven Kingdoms, he might be manipulating events north of the Wall. So the others will march south and set in motion their path to mutual destruction against the last Valyrians, the Targaryens. In fact, there may be clues the Targaryens were also manipulated by the children. If you know who the Ghost of Highheart is, you know she is somehow connected to the children and the old gods. She lives at Highheart, which was once the abode of the children and their green seers. At only three feet tall, she may even be related to them, given their historically small stature. She has red eyes, which are supposedly a genetic marker some children were born with, those gifted as green seers or green sight. Considering she has visions of the future through dreams, it's likely she does have the green sight. But with Thoros of Mir saying the werewoods whisper in her ear when she sleeps, we can safely say the ghost of Highheart is connected to the children and the old gods. But how is she connected to the Targaryens? Well, before she was the ghost of Highheart, she was simply the witch witch companion to Jenny of Old Stones. Jenny was in love with Prince Duncan Targaryen, and she often brought her woods witch to the king's court, even claiming her to be one of the children of the forest. One day the woods witch prophesied that the prince that was promised would be born from the line of Ares and Rayla Targaryen, and so their father Prince Jaehaerys forced them to marry. To put this in perspective, someone connected to the children was given a vision by the old gods that the prince that was promised would be born from a particular Targaryen bloodline. This is interesting, as it is strongly suggested that these visions are shown deliberately. Jaime Lannister, for example, had a dream which influenced him to save Brienne, a dream he had after sleeping on the Weirwood stump, and Weirwoods supposedly whisper in people's ears. 
Whatever the case, the Woods Witch did practically help the Targaryens by giving them her prophecy, born from a vision granted by the gods of the children. In addition, she was so close to the Targaryens, or at least to Jenny and Prince Duncan, that she may have actually been there at Summer Hall when King Aegon tried to hatch dragon eggs, as she said she gorged on grief at Summer Hall. Her presence there to witness the potential rebirthing of dragons has many implications. She is essentially a proxy for the old gods and the children through the visions granted to her. Her presence there must have meant something. Could she have been there to help the Targaryens hatch the dragon eggs? Like the children who may have once guided the Valyrians to harness dragons, could they have attempted to do so again through the ghost of Highheart? It would simply be history repeating itself.